Fantastic. Mm -hmm. right, so. so good evening and welcome to the town board of the town of Ossining work session for Tuesday, March 16th, 2021. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I think I'm gonna be in trouble because I didn't let Councilman Welcher stand up before I started. <laughs> okay, maybe he didn't see that. He usually does stand up. Um, okay, so anyway, um, we're going, are we, we do not need a roll call because we now have a special meeting. So before I get to some of the media announcements, uh, this one is timely. Sustainable Westchester is hosting an event tonight, which started at 7 p.m., but which you can still jump on to help homeowners save some green by going green. It's being live streamed on Facebook and will cover three important programs available to residents. This is the third in our series discussing energy smart homes, which gives residents an opportunity to speak to contractors about eco-friendly heating and cooling systems that make our indoor air cleaner to breathe and increase the market value of our homes. The second program being shared tonight is Community Solar, which can lower the cost of your electricity bill by 10% without putting solar panels on your home. The newest of tonight's great programs is called Grid Rewards, which lets residents earn cash when you reduce your energy consumption at peak usage times of the year. You can learn more about these programs at sustainablewestchester.com. Another thing that's happening tonight, also timely, is Village of Briarcliff elections uh, for their trustees, and I believe that they have a referendum as well, and that is available for voters until 9 p.m. tonight at the uh, Vesio Community Center slash library. So please do take the opportunity to exercise your democratic right to vote and select your uh, local um, representatives if you live in the village of Austin. Yesterday was another great eco-minded webinar. Green Austin hosted What's Your Carbon Footprint? Unveiling an app to help residents track their progress. That's called the Carbon Tracker. A lot of our favorite Green Austin events were postponed or canceled last year, and we're very excited to see them coming back. They announced this week that their famous townwide tag sale will be Saturday, May 1st, which might seem far away, but we'll be here before we know it. Green Austin promotes the sale with signage, a map uh, that you can get on your phone to participating properties, neighborhood signs, and much more. So if you want to participate, let them know very soon so you can get your property on the map. And it really does help um, get people to your tag sale. Here's another future event to add to your calendar. The Town of Austin Comprehensive Plan Public Workshop. Join us April 8th to help shape the future of land use in Austin. This workshop will be an interactive opportunity for the public to review the draft goals. See how your input has been incorporated into this draft vision for the town, share more input, and stay involved in this process. The meeting will be held on Zoom, so check out our website or Facebook event to get the logon information, and there will be other ways to participate as well. And again, our comprehensive plan is called Sustainable Austin. Yesterday, we joined other municipal leaders for a weekly conversation about our pandemic response. These conference calls within County Executive George Latimer and his team, um, I'm sorry, these conference calls with County Executive George Latimer and his team with other municipal leaders across the county have been held weekly since the start of the pandemic. This week, County Executive George Latimer invited Senator Chuck Schumer to speak with us about the American Rescue Plan Act. Stimulus checks from this relief package have already begun appearing in American bank accounts. The act also allocated money for hard hit businesses, religious centers and municipalities. According to numbers from Senator Schumer's and Congressman Mondaire Jones's offices, the big news um, that we are supposed to get an awful lot of money and the big news that we learned this week is that Austin community is slated to receive up to $14 million as part of the American Rescue Plan, approximately $10 million to the Austin schools, and a little over $4 million allocated to the town of Austin, which will ultimately be split among the town and villages of Austin and Briarcliff. We are still waiting for specific details on this direct assistance 
what it can be used for and when it will arrive, but we believe that it will be here pretty soon. Right now, in general ter terms, we know the municipal aid can be used for infrastructure improvements to supplement revenue shortfalls as a result of the pandemic, sewer and water infrastructure, specifically broadband and small business assistance among a few. We also know that there are these specific pots of money dedicated to helping small businesses and not-for-profits as well as helping with broadband. So we hope that this money will go a long way to help our community members through these difficult times. I did share some resources for small businesses in my supervisor's update last week relating to these other aspects of the bill like grants and payroll protection plans, loans, and I will continue to share this information as it becomes available. For more information, you are also welcome to contact my office at 914-762-6001, or you can also directly contact Center, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's local office at 914-734-1532. They can help walk you through the process to get the aid you need. The Austin Angels are helping our community navigate the online vaccine signup process. And I just got off the phone, the another Zoom call with them. They were having their first meeting of volunteers to get a little bit more organized. If you know somebody who wants an appointment but has not been able to get one, you can contact the group at O Town Vaccine Angels at gmail.com. We are hoping a mobile vaccination unit will soon become available to reach those individuals who are homebound and therefore have not been able to get a vaccine. The county did share with us this Monday that on that phone call that I had mentioned earlier that they have just been told they will receive their first 200 doses for the homebound. So we are hopeful more will be in the pipeline and a plan will be in place soon to roll this out. If you know someone who would like to be added to our homebound list, please contact my office at 762-6001, or you can email me at dlevenberg at townofostany.com. Westchester County is offering an exam for people looking to become police officers, and the deadline is at the end of the month, which is fast approaching, so do sign up now if you'd like to begin a career in law enforcement. The Austin Police Department has released a series of videos to help people learn how to sign up for the exam. If your internet access is limited, you can visit the police station lobby where they have set up an application station. Signups for the exam are allowed until the end of the month and the police department will be sharing reminders until then. If you're not interested in becoming a police officer, but would like to become a civil servant in a different area, Westchester County offers a whole host of civil service exams for positions ranging from office work to engineering. The town, along with all other municipalities, fire districts, and school districts, is required to hire off of these civil service lists for most positions. So please visit humanresources.westchester.gov. I mean, I'm sorry, humanresources.westchestergov.com to learn more about all civil service exams and positions open across the county. Every Tuesday in March, the Austin PTA is partnering with local businesses for their Takeout Tuesday fundraiser. So as I have encouraged you at our other March meetings, pick up your phone now, go to the Austin PTA Facebook page and put your order in. I believe you only have until 8 p.m. and it's already late, so order now. I know I'm hungry. Um, okay, hold on one second, I'm just joking. Okay, the money raised will go to support the senior class of 2021. What a great way to support our students as well as our local businesses. Do not forget to mention the senior class of 2021 when you order so that they can get the credit for it. That's it for me for my announcements. Do any of my board colleagues have anything to add? And hearing none. Fantastic. So we are going to get into the heart of our work session meeting agenda and we're starting out with the New York stretch and oh my goodness and CEC which now I forget what it stands for clean energy communities. I have there's too many acronyms in this group and you are going to see that I'm going to try not to use any more acronyms tonight we're starting. Of course, I'm going to in one second. Tonight, we're starting with a presentation on New York Stretch Energy Codes, which is going to be led by Anila uh, Cherian and also Mike Dwayne from NYSERDA. Anila is with the Hudson Valley Regional Council, and she's going to share with us a brief overview of the newly launched round of NYSERDA, New York State Energy Research and Development, a association, I don't know, clean energy communities program and how adopting New York stretch can increase the town's participation in this new program. 
We're always looking for ways to, to decrease our brown and increase our green footprint in Austin and earn recognition and grant dollars for our sustainability initiatives at the same time. These two offerings from NYSERDA will help us make Austin even greener. We also have our building inspector, John Hamilton, and planner Valerie Minastra on tonight, so I hope they'll be able to weigh in on how these programs can benefit Austin. Before I turn it over to Chris and Mike, Valerie, is there anything you would like to add? And then I'm actually, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Anila actually. Do you have anything to add? No, I do not. Okay, so in that case, Anila, welcome and thank you. I know you've been touring the Zoom, uh, New York, all of the New York Zooms uh, in this region at least. Uh, please tell us what um, what is CEC all about? How can it benefit us to go greener? And how can we help our residents save money and save the earth all at the same time? That is quite uh, an introduction and what a lovely town. I know that Mike and I, listening to this, we, we, we wish we lived in the town of Austin with all the wonderful things that you're doing there. Um, I so you welcome. say that to all the towns. I did for <laughs> no, I don't. Night. I actually, I actually don't. I mean, Mike, you would agree with me. This, this is like the, the, the most relaxed and the, the best introduction that we've ever had. Pretty um, good. And, so, and so, you know, I did live there one night, so I, you know. We like so it. he's an expert. He's going to be an expert. Mike is an expert. We're, we're in for a treat, Town of Austin. You are going to hear from Mike DeWine, who, as I mentioned to you, uh, Mr. Hamilton, has trained all the code officials up and down New York State and up and down and across the, the, the country. So we're in for a treat on New York Stretch, and I am going to launch right in with some acronyms. Uh, and just to let you know, NYSERDA, the A stands for authority. authority. Um, can I share my screen, or do you, do you allow me to do that? Okay, yep, you should be able to. Excellent. Um, so here I go. I am going to tell you all about the wonderful things that the town of Austin is already doing and how you can uh, improve uh, your, your green, uh, greening of green Austin. So what is New York Stretch and why is it important? Uh, New York Stretch is important because we are, we are a community. Austin is, as are, as are other communities, located in New York State, which has adopted the very ambitious, very transformative, another acronym, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. This is, is, this is globally an, an amazing and act because it, it commits all of us as municipalities and as citizens and residents to work towards energy efficiency and uh, clean energy actions in the context of climate change. So that's how you understand New York Stretch because the goal of New York Stretch is to promote energy efficiency in the construction of both new and renovated buildings. Now, Mike and I um, have been giving these presentations to a variety of municipalities, really um, pun intended, heating up in uh, the Mid-Hudson region. And one of the reasons has been that the NYSERDA's CEC program, which is what, what, you know, it's clean energy communities. The clean energy communities program has a variety of grant options recently. And, it was launched, uh, the, the recent grant cycle was launched on January 26, 2021. Ahead of January 26, 2021, the city of Beacon adopted New York stretch code, followed by the village of Hastings and my own village where I volunteer before I became a clean energy coordinator, the village of Dobbs Ferry. And subsequent to that, the town of Bedford has adopted it. Now, one of the reasons why we are before the town board in Austin is because adopting New York stretch energy code can allow the town of Austin to not only be a leader in energy efficiency, but also access an action grant, <clears throat> uh, a $5,000 action grant. And, it, and, and if you decide to use that action grant towards a clean energy community project that you have in your town and you award a project in a, in a disadvantaged community, you have the ability to get a bonus grant of $10,000. That's, that's an added bonus. So what, are, what is the clean energy community? It has a series of um, 13 high impact actions. And I, and, and I have had a, the, the great opportunity to talk to your supervisor uh, and a great team at the town of Austin and walk them through all these uh, high impact actions. And the town of Austin has actually done six of these already. You have benchmarked, uh, passed a resolution on municipal benchmarking. You have done something on clean fleets with the potential of doing more if you 
implement a charger or, or get some clean fleets. Uh, you've already uploaded your community choice aggregation and you've gotten your 1500 points supervisor and you have uploaded the PACE energy finance authorization. So now you're sitting at a 1900 points. Adopting New York stretch would allow you to get the additional points that would put you to get a, not only the action grant, but now you have the opportunity to get a, uh, the, a point-based grant. Because if you get past the threshold of 3,000 points, you get another tranche of money. And then when you got, get closer to 4,000 points, you get a, a, an additional tranche of money. So I have, I, I have the, I, I'm happy to walk the town of Austin through the grant process once they start submitting more clean energy impact actions. And I'm hoping that you will give a good here to, to Mike and adopt New York Stretch. So if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me and I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. Before Mike starts, I just wanna let you know that we, we just really need to upload a couple of more of the actions because we do have we do believe that we have quite a other uh, quite a few additional high impact actions that we've either already undertaken um, and haven't gotten credit yet credit for yet or that we got credit for but we can get credit for again so um you know, absolutely you I'm, and i'm happy to walk your team yeah. uh through all of them uh you know just feel free to reach out to me and we can do it tomorrow and walk through yeah. everything and help you with it Absolutely. So with, with no further ado, Mike DeWine. Thank you. Can I ask, one, go. Can I ask one quick question? Yes, sir. I, I noticed here the unified solar permit. Um, yes. We currently use our own permit, which people seem to like. Us. Solar companies never have a problem with Are you saying we have to switch to a different permit? So, so the unified solar permit was, uh, was uh, something that NYSERDA advocated the use of uh, in 2016, and a lot of municipalities have adopted it. It's a streamlined resolution. It's a two-page template-based resolution. I can send it to you, Mr. Hamilton. You can look at it. And if you need any guidance in, in terms of like comparing and contrasting, I'm happy to put resources from NYSERDA. We can review it. But basically, it's a streamlined resolution. And it has been adopted by other municipalities in Westchester. It's a two-page template resolution. We did. Yeah, it's only two pages as well. We, yes. did, we did adopt the NYSERDA model solar code. And that you did. So this was renewed. This was this was done in 2016. So I will share with you. Maybe you have adopted. I have to check and see uh, what you adopted. So if you share that, Mr. Hamilton, and I will be happy to send you the uh, uh, template resolution, and you can compare and contrast. Okay. And just one other question, real fast. I noted the code so, enforcement training. Is that the training we're currently taking in the New York State Energy Code? So that's that's something that Mike Devine will will definitely touch on. NYSERDA offers e this energy code, what they call ECET, um, within, as, as, and, and Mike will touch upon it. The last time it was offered, as, as, because it requires an in-person training, was June 2019. And as a result of COVID, because it requires an in-person training, we are hoping to roll it out sometime in the third quarter in the Mid-Hudson, uh, third quarter of this year. But Mike will, will, will discuss that, right, Mike? Well, not so much the ECET training, the, which yes. I think is available now. Um, not as yet, not as yet in the Mid-Hudson, not, not anywhere, not anywhere. So I have, and I discussed this with the supervisor, I have municipalities that have adopted 12 of the 13 high impact action items. And the one that they're waiting for is this energy code enforcement training to be officially offered by NYSERDA. Okay, so, so now I just, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and so I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. Any further questions, I'm more than uh, happy to answer. But remember, with the adoption of New York Stretch, you have the opportunity to, to get to the 3,000 point threshold, grant money and the 4,000. So, Mike, take it away. I'm gonna stop yeah, sharing. You need, to, you need to stop sharing. I will, Done. There you go, thank you, dear. So, good evening, everybody. And you can see my you can see my uh, my screen okay, correct? Uh, and I, I don't know any of you, but there isn't much time for introductions, so I'm just going to launch into it. Uh, just on that point of the energy code enforcement training, that training is really about uh, the existing New York State Energy Code, which has been in effect for about a year, uh, that is designed for the clean energy communities, communities uh, to get a special look at um, ways to invest enforcement. 
And then building on that, there also will be uh, training on the, the New York stretch code as well. Uh, what's the New York uh, stretch energy code? Well, it's a, it's a readily adoptable uh, local energy code that's enabled by Article 11 of the, of the state energy law. Uh, since the energy code was initially adopted in 1979, and I have to tell you that I've been around and dealing with the energy code in New York since 1979. So you'll note that I'm an old guy to start with. I'm sorry, um, Mike. Um, I don't think we can see your screen, so you might want to try sharing. Uh, I don't DM. understand why not, but let yeah. me try again. One oh, more time. I had time trouble getting in tonight, so I'm yep. having revenge of the Tuesday night gremlins. Um, so can you see this well enough? I like going, I don't necessarily want to go from full screen unless you don't like the way it looks right now. Tell me what you think. I think we're good. If that's okay. good for you, we, we can see it. There's a reason for that, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to hold you in suspense. Um, so um, again, the, uh, it's authorized by Article 11, uh, which was uh, something that um, a very smart old friend of mine decided to do so that communities could do better than the base energy code. Because the base energy code, uh, while some people will whine and gnash their teeth about it, uh, it's the worst you can do by law, right? So the regular energy code isn't any big deal. The New York stretch code is a big deal, although it's only about 10% uh, more efficient than the current energy code. The idea is that it's a one cycle energy code. In about three years, we'll be adopting an updated version of the national model code with New York uh, elements in it. And, um, and uh, you know, it'll be about the same level as the New York stretches today. So this is kind of an interim thing to help prepare folks uh, for the upcoming codes. Uh, and uh, of course, because of utility and other incentives, you know, builders and developers can get paid for it. Why not take advantage of it uh, a year or two or three ahead? Um, and this code is, is, it's nothing super special. It's what you would call uh, state of the shelf. In other words, it's technologies, insulation, materials that are available right now. Um, and a lot of better builders and high performance builders are already doing and using those technologies. Uh, so uh, it's, it's easily achievable. So it doesn't require any, any new stuff to, the, to, uh, to comply with the energy code and the New York stretch. Uh, the reason uh, for the New York stretch is it keeps us uh, a little bit ahead of and on pace with, with what will be the next change, the 2021 IC, IECC that you see here. Whereas if business were as usual, and I don't know who made this gra graph, but the business as usual would, would most likely not be on a decline as it is without the code. So uh, that business as usual would be even flatter line, but of course the lower the line goes, the less energy that buildings use. And you know, the, the good thing about this, this, the codes in general is that they address comprehensively the 40% on average of the energy we use in our buildings uh, nationally and in New York State, uh, and in some regions more than that. So uh, it's the best way to, to address energy use in your community by a long shot. Uh, and there's lots of, uh, of energy and non-energy benefits, uh, of course, lower you know, energy use means, you know, businesses have better bottom lines. It means residents have more disposable income or, you know, can find it easier to pay their bills because in a standard mortgage, they save, um, you know, they save every month they pay into their mortgage over a, a home built to the, uh, to the New York energy code, base code. 
Uh, and, that, and we know from many, many, many studies um, uh, that energy savings uh, created in your community stays in your community in the form of jobs, in the form of, uh, you know, disposable income, uh, money to invest in businesses and what's, what's have you. Um, there's a lot of workforce development going on right now. NYSERDA is investing huge in that. And the energy professionals and the equipment and the materials used uh, all see investment because of the energy codes um, and energy efficient. And we also know that energy efficient uh, buildings built to the New York stretch code uh, are greater, have greater comfort, uh, they're more resilient, um, and they're healthier. Uh, all reasons that it would take me uh, many hours to totally explain to you, and I'm welcome to do that in a, on a sidebar. Uh, as far as the cost impacts go, uh, generally by climate zone, uh, the weighted averages are, um, uh, and you see 4A there, climate zone 4A is the climate zone in the energy code that determines the requirements but is also where Ossining is in Westchester County, which is climate zone four. Uh, the construction weight of building type is uh, over 70%. The energy cost savings is something over 5%. And uh, we see you know, 10 to 11% paybacks depending on the type of building or what have you. This is an average uh, with a, a, a first cost of about 85 cents a square foot but uh, very cost effective. And we also, um, we also know that, uh, that uh, the uh, residential construction is even more cost effective, 10% uh, uh, or, or less with total incremental costs around a range of 1500 to $2,400 uh, per, per dwelling. Um, and an annual savings of $264, which isn't a lot, but it is a savings every month in a typical uh, mortgage. What's different in these codes? Uh, very little. It's a, again, it's a 10 to 11% difference. So we're not looking at state of the art, we're looking at state of the shelf. <clears throat> a, little more, um, a little more insulation in the building envelope, enclosure, uh, lighting and electrical, requirements are a little bit tighter, which can be achieved a number of different ways to make it work best for builders and uh, contractors, uh, improved mechanical equipment requires. And there's also requirements to uh, lower the soft costs of going solar and electrical vehicle uh, uh, capable uh, in solar and EV readiness. In other words, preparing the, the building or the house so that it's easy to hook up uh, both e uh, photovoltaics and uh, electrical vehicle uh, charging stations. Likewise, on the residentials, very simple approaches. There also is a passive house compliance path, a very popular program in the greater New York area that's drawing a lot of attention from real estate folks and buyers in general. Um, a little bit better uh, uh, ERI compliance, which is another performance path. There is a requirement for um, uh, for HRVs and ERVs in higher climate zones, but standard ventilation uh, per the baseline code. So, um, and and here's where you can take a look at the uh, a terrific um, resource site. I'll talk a little bit more about it down the road, but. Um, you have this link in your presentation. Uh, as far as, and, and there has been some concern from jurisdictions that we've pretty much put to bed uh, because, um, you know, there are some concern that uh, if the code also impacts uh, existing buildings, then, you know, is it going to raise costs and, and discourage development? Well, the existing energy code re already requires uh, requirements or has requirements for existing buildings. So they apply to, to new uh, renovations or additions, 
in the same way. And really what it comes down to is uh, in most cases, the things you are changing in a building renovation have to comply, which uh, nine times out of 10 you're doing anyway, because it's a chance to improve your efficiency of your building and it's silly not to. Plus um, there's all sorts of uh, Con Ed and other NIPA, uh, if, um, incentives to do that as well as design assistance from NYSERDA. And likewise, uh, there's uh, uh, in new buildings, um, uh, there's, there's never any requirement for specific building products. Uh, now, a lot of communities ask, well, can we amend the New York stretch code? Well, sure you can, uh, however, if you amend the stretch code to make it weaker in some way than the, uh, uh, the full New York stretch code, uh, you won't be eligible to get the CEC points and grants. Uh, so it has to be as stringent as. There have been a couple of communities that said, well, what about if we just adopt it for new construction? Or what about, uh, let's just do it for residential. Uh, one of the uh, New York uh, communities uh, that has been doing a, uh, an advanced code for years uh, that recently adopted, um, wanted to just do it for residential. And then, you know, when they learned and saw how, how easy it is for, uh, for commercial buildings to comply as well, they just went ahead and adop adopted them. Uh, you do have to file or register your adoption with the Department of State. And as long as you haven't changed uh, the New York stretch code to weaken it. Um, it's just a registration process. And then uh, there's all sorts of uh, support materials and resources, as I mentioned before. If you do change your code, there may be those resources may not be fully usable in your jurisdiction. So you kind of throw that option out. Other communities are worried and have heard about third party inspection and verification. Well, that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, the base New York Energy Code already requires some third party inspection and verification. You may or may not have heard that all new homes have to pass a blower door test to see how leaky they are. Uh, terrific requirement that really saves a ton of energy plus makes your, your air quality much healthier uh, as well. Uh, but, um, and also there's communities that are using home energy raters and have for some of them a couple decades. The ones I mentioned earlier that previously adopted an advanced energy code because of this article, not this New York stretch, but one uh, that was at the time more stringent. So, there's uh, some on the commer commercial side, commercial air barrier testing and commissioning, um, commercial HVAC and service water heating uh, commissioning. You have to make sure that the mechanical ventilation performs properly. A great plus uh, with the New York stretch in this time of COVID. And again, as I said earlier, passive house compliance. Uh, if you do use a third party, well, who's responsible for securing them? And again, that's, um, that's uh, you know, the job of the permit applicant, the owner, the developer, the builder, whoever. Uh, it's not carried in any way by the jurisdiction. So there's no added work there, um, nor are they uh, required to perform the work. Um, they just uh, pass that along and any cost for it along to the builder. Uh, and the neat thing about that is, especially with one of the uh, compliance paths, there are several, which I won't get into here, but your building department might want me to with them at some point. Um, they take advantage of these third parties and they can lessen the load of the building energy code and the New York stretch significantly, which once they understand how that works, they are very excited about. And then we can guide you to the, the third party uh, if, if needed and if desired uh, qualifications for such uh, beyond what's already required in the base uh, New York State Energy Code. So as I mentioned, a terrific set of resources available 
from NYSERDA, incentivized by NYSERDA. There's us, the circuit riders. And I haven't been in Ossining to spend any time, much less a night, uh, since 1972. So come on, let's get with it here. A lot has changed. So you got Oh, no back. doubt. I actually passed through once for a beer. And oh. the beer was very good. But I forget the name of the place. Oh, yeah. um, we, we so you'll have to help me there. I, the only thing I ask for tonight is that you help me find the correct beer. Okay. Um, there's an adoption guide. So there's a whole law set up for you by uh, NYSERDA and their council uh, that you can take and have your council just, you know, if you need to make a few sm small changes to adopt the rule for your lawmaking process, you can do that. There's going to be um, additional training, as I mentioned, uh, two half-day trainings uh, for just the New York stretch um, and a bunch of code enforcement tools that we're currently working on uh, to make things that much easier, not only for the New York stretch, but things that they haven't even seen for the base New York State Energy Code because they're an overlay and they work together and they work just like each other. Um, they'll be able to take advantage of that as well. There's a software package that most uh, jurisdictions ask for as part of permit application documentation. Say that 10 times fast. Um, Res check and com check, it's a US DOE Department of Energy product that I helped generate uh, back in like 95, 96. So I'm even latter day old. Um, uh, there's a hotline set up for all kinds of technical uh, information, interpretation. That's the site where everything is at. And again, you know, if you do local amendments, and I just, I, I just ask you, just adopt it as it is. It's, it's really a well thought out code. And uh, uh, if you mess around with it too much, uh, you don't get quite the advantage from the tools like the ResCheck Web and ComCheck Web. Here's a map of where it's happening. Uh, they're neck and neck in the Hudson Valley in great part because of Ania's work and Carla Castillo as well. Um, and, and the list is here of those who have adopted, Town of Bedford being the latest, but probably a half dozen in process. So uh, you gotta get on with it because I, you know, I want that beer and you, know, <laughs> you gotta get things going here. Um, <laughs> here's your here's your uh, your contact people with me at the bottom. Um, I, I encourage you very much, and I'm not kidding at all here. Uh, I, I'm I'm glad to be working with you folks who are the forward thinkers in this region, and I work especially well with your code officials, code folks that you know do the work of it. I've trained them for over 30 years uh, statewide, and most of them know me. And I'm glad to spend special time present presenting and helping them become familiar with us so they're not scared. Uh, and in most Thank cases, uh, the code officials testify in, in, um, in support of, of these uh, adoptions. So Mike, we're going to put that to the test because we have our building inspector or code enforcement officer on right now, John Hamilton. So John, you're the code us. official. How long have you been there? Uh, 107 years now. Uh, <laughs> just shy of my 108. Right on, man. I've been here since 2000. Uh, I was in the village of Austin from 97. And then I came here, I think it was around 2006 or so. Something good like for that. you. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize have... this guy, John? John, do you recognize Mike? Well, I've taken classes uh, that he's uh, hosted. Okay. Great. Great. I'm glad to hear that. And uh, I'm, at, I'm at Westchester, Nisbach a lot, and Tri-State, and, and online more than I want to be. And I'm actually going to get to do a, a real live training in two weeks. I'm excited. Nice. So any questions right now, I'm glad to ask, answer. Uh, you're with, you know, you got me whenever you need me. Uh, we'll come to hearings. We'll work with, the, with John. Um, and, um, you know, anybody that... Uh, uh, you need us to work with glad to do. Great. So Mike, if you could just stop sharing your screen for a second, and then I'll ask the board if they have any questions as well as 
I'm also going to ask John Hamilton. I'm, the board may ask John if he would like to ask questions first. I'm going to see if I, once you stop sharing your screen, if I could see everybody's. I'm trying. Video. I'm trying. Jeez. Okay. No, that's okay. Uh, so, board, are you okay with, with our uh, code enforcement officer asking some questions first? Okay, that's what I thought you were going to say. Uh, John Hamilton, do you have any questions? Just a couple. Um, so I'm assuming that the property owners don't get any kind of a rebate or a tax break if they uh, if they are doing this because it's it'll be the entire municipality wide. Well, actually, they might uh, because there are all sorts of, uh, especially Con Edison um, benefits and incentives for many pieces many of the requirements in the New York stretch code. I wish I had, uh, and we had the, had the charge to actually look more into that. I keep hounding them and hopefully we'll get to do that. Maybe you could put in a special uh, request and say, geez, we'd like to know what incentives might apply to this. Okay, we can do that. Um, anyway, uh, but, but uh, all sorts of, for higher efficiency, uh, HVAC equipment, there's, there's, uh, there's stuff for low to moderate income people, insulation, uh, weatherization type stuff, and all the way up through, you know, minute, middle and upper middle income uh, folks who are building new homes uh, for more insulation. Uh, on the renovation side, particularly for, um, for commercial building, where, uh, where the, again, the increment's uh, about the same, but um, the buildings are bigger, uh, or maybe bigger, maybe not. I'm sure they're not, you know, building huge buildings in, in Austin, but there are commercial buildings, I'm sure, that get renovated. And, and they, there's a bunch of uh, options there, too, uh, that you can steer people to. It might be worth talking to uh, the Con Edison marketing folks who would be all over it if you said, hey, could you teach us what we can tell our our developers and our builders in terms of how they can get money to do this stuff that's going to be code in two or three years. They can get money to, to go that difference now. Why not? Right? So now. And tonight we were talking about how we had the um, Energy Smart Homes uh, presentation and that um, does talk a little bit about some of those incentives um, to upgrade um, energy efficiencies, you know, to make for heating and cooling systems as well as other energy efficiency like insulation. Just, yeah, sorry. the heating and cooling is, is big, especially if you go electric, which is the big push, as you may or may not know, in New York State to transfer from natural gas, oil, or propane to electric heating systems in the form of high efficiency heat pumps. I don't know if you've run across that much yet, but. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting more permit requests for heat pumps. How are your permits looking right now? I know. Uh, Everybody I talk to in that region is seeing, some of them are seeing double what they've seen in the past, akin to right after 9-11 when people were getting out of the city. That's what's happening now. From here to Lake Placid, I can tell you that. Yeah, we're finding people aren't moving, they're renovating. Um, so we're getting yep. all the permits for renovations. We're not getting that many for new houses, we're getting a lot of renovations. And yes. I thought we'd have more people moving out, but we're not getting as many as I thought we would. I have Can I just weigh in quickly nice on something? To live. I just right. wanted to weigh in quickly, uh, uh, Mr. Hamilton. There, there is, uh, the town of Rye has signed on to PACE financing. And so there is that, that, that ability for property developers in the town, oh, sorry, town of Austining. I'm, I'm presenting to so many towns now, I'm losing my mind. The town of Austining has signed on to PACE financing. So if you have a property developer or a commercial entity that wants to get low cost uh, clean energy financing, they can get that through EIC PACE. And if such a property uh, uh, owner accesses that said financing from EIC PACE, you can actually get additional points uh, via the CEC program. The, the, up to them. I leave it up to the bosses. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, so this I have, I, no, I was going to say, I have a quick question um, when John is done, if, if you have more questions. Just a couple of quick ones. So this is 
in conjunction with the energy code. It's not a replacement for the energy code. You'll just have certain areas that you'll supersede the existing code. That is correct. Okay. A lot of the base requirements remain the same. So again, and, and it's handy that it's a, a direct overlay of the existing code because you still have to make sure all that other stuff complies mm -hmm. to the best of your ability. And I know, um, you know, you, you folks, code officials have a whole lot of codes to enforce. And, and it's, it's, um, uh, it's important that it be made as easy as possible. And that's why, you know, we've created some tools and systems to help make it that way. And uh, it wouldn't take much for you to pick up on that um, and those opportunities as well. And I think you'll, you'll like it. Mm -hmm. um, and many code officials, you know, they're happy if they get um, proper documentation that at least just tells them everything they need mm -hmm. to do a proper plan review or site inspection, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and rather than spending your time chasing the applicants around for information. Yeah. My last question, the third party inspectors that you mentioned, um, they get certified through certain agencies. Um, and do you have the list of those agencies that are qualified to certify them? So we know when they say I'm certified by X, Y, Z, I can look in your booklet and see that, yes, that was acceptable to New York State. Yeah, we, we don't have a real comprehensive list right now. It, it's, um, but that's another one of the things that we're wanting to put together. Um, the folks that you use right now for new construction residential, the home energy raters and the um, home performance contractors that also work under the home performance with energy star uh, programs and, uh, and such, they're the ones that do the blower door and duct blaster tests that you have now. Uh, they're the ones that do most of the residential stuff. So that's all the same. Um, on the commercial side, the new baseline energy code has a number of kind of new requirements. For example, commercial buildings now have air barrier requirements. And if they don't, if they don't give you the proper documentation, you can just have them do a blower door test mm -hmm. on the building. Um, so there's that sort of thing. And in creating air barriers, commissioning of, of replacement HVAC systems. If they're commercial size, um, they have to be commissioned and we, when we'll have that, a list of where you can go and what certifications are, are uh, available there as well. So you won't get left in the lurch. If there's something missing, we'll get it to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. My now, pleasure. Okay. Yeah, I just have, yeah, I just have one question. You mentioned that, um, if the town were to adopt this, all you'd have to do is register just with the state, as long as you did not weaken anything that was you know, established in the code. So if we decide to alter certain provisions, or for example, we decide to apply certain provisions to, you know, I don't know, one type of uh, construction versus another, that would have another uh, process registering with the state? Well, again, if it makes it more stringent, you're okay. If it weakens it, makes it less stringent. For example, as I mentioned before, one town wanted to just adopt it for residential. Well, you know, that would have had to go through a completely different review. In addition to that, it wouldn't have complied for your clean energy community points. So you'd be throwing 1,200 points and for starters, $5,000 plus perhaps another $10,000 out the window. So, uh, yeah, if you wanted to make it stronger, you could, you could do that. But, you know, seek our advisement first. Uh, I don't know if you have some ideas to that end, but I'm glad to talk to you about that to give you some guidance before you uh, consider that further. Okay, thank you. Yep. And now I would like to open it up to my board colleagues, uh, if anybody has any questions for either Anila or for Mike. Or for John Hamilton, for that matter, you can ask him too. Even Valerie. I just want to make sure that you all have seen, or uh, Valerie, have you had access to that, the, the actual resolution? Are you able to, to review it? Have you been able to see it? Uh, the resolution itself? 
Yeah. Uh, I haven't started reviewing that at this point. And I think okay. we'll also probably want to look at the actual code itself. So that's probably the next steps that John and I will be undertaking. Absolutely. And we're here to support you. And everything is accessible on the NYSERDA CEC website. They actually have made it really simple. It's, it's available in Word format. So, you know, you can amend it. And, and uh, both the resolution and the guide, as, as, as uh, Mike uh, said, are all available. And we have our council on as well. Uh, yes. So, yeah. So thank you. Uh, again, it doesn't seem like any of the board has any questions. Is that true? No, I'm excited that we're looking at this. I've wanted to look at this for a while since I talked to uh, some of the people from Bedford about it. So, yep. Bedford, oh. Hastings, and, and I, I have talked to the mayor of Hastings um, a couple of times about it. She's super excited and she's sort of like now on the bandwagon to just get everybody to quickly adopt stretch code. So um, thank you to Nikki Armacos, the mayor of Hastings for, for her advocacy. And she was reaching out to me one day, the, I think Sustainable Westchester was the one, was it that who hosted the stretch code? Yes, um, uh, we hosted it with Sustainable Westchester. And Nikki was a featured speaker along with the city of Beacon because those were the two first municipalities that ever adopted it. So right. it has been adopted, a variant of it has been adopted in New York City. Mm -hmm. And then after that city of Beacon, Hastings. And yes. soon maybe Austin, who knows? Absolutely, uh, soon maybe Austin. I don't see anybody yelling and screaming about it yet. John Hamilton, he yells and screams quietly and then we fig fig figure it all out. And <laughs> but, you know, Mike, if, if, if you're on the team here, I think, you know, you can talk to John and um, we can try to figure out how to make this, you know, workable, which it sounds like, again, it's already been in place in other municipalities that are not too dissimilar to Austin. So um, we can we can hopefully make this work because I think that, you know, getting ahead of any kind of um, energy improvements now, um, even if they're going to be standard in a couple of years is, is to our advantage. And ultimately, actually, we heard a presentation re recently as part of the um, Energy Smart Homes, um, uh, you know, um, effort that we're, that we're undertaking with, um, with Sustainable Westchester and Briarcliff and Austin uh, from this company, I want to say they're called Pearl or am I confusing that with something else? They actually go in and, and um, they, they figure out the value of the um, energy improvements that the value adds to homes. Um, and that, you know, also is something that realtors would be interested in. It really does add value to your home, which I guess kind of gets to the question that John asked earlier about um, tax um, tax benefits. If there are any tax benefits, there, there are, but they're also, you know, your assessment may also go up because of the energy improvements, but ultimately the value of your home goes up. So you're going to be able to get more out of it um, in the long run. And you are going to see those savings um, from the energy improvements annually at some point when you're, when you have the payback of the, of those energy improvements to your building. So there's well, not that. And there's state and federal tax credits right, and right now as well. So Right. And a lot of those things, you know, will actually start to sunset at some point. So the, the sooner you can get in on a lot of those tax credits, a lot of those improvements, the more likely you're to get the bigger tax credits, um, you know, if you do those sorts of things up front. Right. And Mike also mentioned that that, that early adopter piece has a streamlined manual, Mr. Hamilton. There's a streamlined manual that's really, uh, that, that's quite a selling point for code officials. So Mike and I stand ready to help in any way you need. And okay. please feel free to reach out to me. I will send you an email to find out what the additional CEC high impact actions you want to upload and get guidance on. And, uh, you know, uh, Valerie, if you have any questions in terms of the legal issues, I'm sure Mike. And, and the other piece that just to, to, to note is that, you know, you, you could be encouraged, Mr. Hamilton, to talk to other code officials that have adopted this. And we're trying to figure out with Mike and Chris an opportunity for code officials to speak amongst themselves. You can do code speak just with Mike Devine. <laughs> yeah, we could do that. Wouldn't that be fun? A... Over, you got to have the beer, though. Don't forget. Exactly. <laughs> do we have the actual code available to look at yet? Uh, yes, it's, it's available on the NYSERDA website, and I can send you the link to it. Um, when I finish, I'll send the supervisor a link, and then she can share it with all of you. It's at that link in your presentation. Exactly. Yeah. And... There will be um, the overlay book where the New York stretch code is dropped right into the base New York State Energy Code. So guess what, John? One book, no supplements, no green books, no blue book. And um, it'll avail, we're trying to get one copy to at least every jurisdiction. And then it will also be on the ICC 
website in electronic version too. That would be good. Yeah. So anytime you need me, John, if you say, damn, I wish I would have asked him this, just pick up the phone and call me. If I don't answer right then, it's because my Springer Spaniel, who's gently chewing on my ankle right now to go outside, um, I'm out walking her, uh, but but don't hesitate. I mean it. Um, anything you got, any of you. Well, as you said, you have the classes. You're going to have the classes where we can get more in depth with this, and then we can start really asking questions at that time. That's that's correct. Plus, uh, I'm developing um, uh, for one of the communities some initial training, a one-hour training that'll just get you up and started too before the intensive uh, classes start. So we may be able to do that. Maybe we can group a few of the of the early adopters together to do that. That's my hope. So stay in touch. We'll, we'll, uh, we're here to help you out. And Sounds I'm not great. from the government. I don't work with NYSERDA. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, Anella. We will be back in touch with you my pleasure. Sure very soon. Thanks Thank for having for us. All the best. Leaders. Lovely. Okay. Awesome. Have a wonderful <laughs> evening and be well. Thank you too. Uh, okay, so next up, we have the now famous uh, departmental report from our uh, building inspector, John Hamilton. I can't top them. <laughs> oh. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll be brief. Um, for the past couple of months, we've actually issued 303 alarm permits. Um, we've issued 59 building plumbing and electrical permits, 19 title searches, I've done 117 inspections for a building, fire, cabaret, public inspection, uh, public uh, assembly, and complaints. Um, as you know, we have two larger projects, the Learning Center and the SPCA. The Learning Center is coming along, a little slower, but they're coming along. Sometimes we have to nudge them, but they're doing okay. Um, SPCA is, is just really making great progress. I'm really impressed with them. Um, even through COVID and the snow, they've really been moving uh, they're into sheetrocking now. Um, we still have time to go. They are hoping to open in May. Mm, we hope. Um, we'll see where it goes, how the weather goes, or if anything else happens. But we are hoping for that. Um, Terra Rustica was approved last night by the zoning board for the deck expansion. So now they'll be working with Valerie and the planning and ARB boards. And Valerie, if she's going to be talking, I don't know, the Rinaldi subdivision and River Knoll are still there before planning. So we've been pretty busy. And um, as I said before, mostly it's, it's additions and alterations. We're not getting that many people that are, that are kind of selling when we do the title searches. A lot of it is refis. So people are staying here and, um, and they're doing a lot of work. Uh, just for revenues alone, we brought in about 35,000 in the last couple of months. And so we've been, we've been very busy. That's Fantastic. It. And Parthenols, is that, are they almost? Parthenols, uh, I, they haven't called me for an inspection in about a month or so. Um, people are complaining that they're not planting trees. And I have to mention there's, there was two feet of snow on the ground and the ground is frozen. We don't normally plant trees during that time. And I try to let people know that um, we're getting complaints on a couple of the uh, different projects. People are complaining the trees aren't in yet. We don't normally, oh, excuse me, the, the developers and contractors don't really landscape until the building is pretty much done and they pull all the heavy equipment out of there. Then they start the landscaping. And when they're ready to go, um, then I invite all the department heads. Valerie knows I just sent a, a, an email out for uh, Thornton Hill. Uh, they have one building left and I want all the departments um, to come out and take a look look at everything, look at your resolutions. Do they owe any fees? Were they supposed to do something they didn't do uh, before we issue that last CO? So we, we, we interact and, and uh, coordinate with the other departments as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Are there questions from the town board for Mr. Hamilton? I don't know, Liz, you look like you're about to say yeah, something. Yeah, I wanna add something. Um, Actually, I had a question about the Learning Center. What ages are they going to be sort of, um, catering to? Or Val, you might be able to answer that one. I don't really know the age group. Um, I believe there it's a daycare center. 
but I'm, but I don't know all the, the ages specifically. Okay. So, so we can get back to you on that information. Okay. I was just wondering. Okay. But they look like they're moving slowly, like John said, but great. The PCA looks amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, I was in there the other day. It's like, you need a map. It's, it's huge. I, I, it, as you know, it's my head project. Uh, so I, I really looking forward to this thing opening and uh, I can't wait to do the final walkthrough. Um, matter of fact, I promise, you don't have a dog. Promise you staff, they can come with me. Do you, have want, dog? you don't have a dog. That was, that was Mike. You don't have a dog. Excuse me. Do you have a dog? I have three. Okay. So don't bring your dogs. That, that might not be good. Actually, uh, I rescued two of them from there. Okay. Well, maybe you should bring them then. They could, they could give the doggy test. No, I'm afraid if I bring them there, they're going to go, oh my God, he's giving us back. <laughs> <laughs> or pick out a few more friends. Yeah. That's, that's what my yeah. wife is afraid of. You don't know. She's really afraid of <laughs> us. I said, you know, four isn't so bad. And she said, if four comes in, you go out. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Any other questions? Or are we good? All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much, John. Have a great night. Thanks for Thank sticking you. with us for the uh, first presentation. It was actually very interesting. It was very interesting. I'm looking forward to uh, to getting the actual paperwork in the law to see how it does look compared to the other energy code. I, yeah. I'm really curious to see how it's going to go. Okay, fantastic. But right. I think the next steps will be to look at the actual code itself, as well as the resolution, as well as the approval process, because I think that's all going to, we're going to need to look at that. And then we're it actually applies to and what types of construction. Um, so I, I think there there is some initial work that we need to do and we'll get back to the board on that and I'll circle up with uh, Christy and John on those elements. So the only thing I, so is, is again, is he saying, oh, we just have to adopt the resolution. We don't have to go through a public um, a public hearing process to, to adopt that? I think, it, I mean, I need more information. This is, you know, this is the first time we're talking about it. I would would be done by local law right maybe because it's just an a, it, because it's really new york if you adopt the new york stretch codes you're not i don't know anyway it's something that it's interesting that part of it is interesting it's a little different so we shall see well i think it's also going to be a little bit different than the um than the battery energy storage system as well as the solar uh, you know because those were model laws that we were able to you know um amend to fit our individual needs, where this one seems very much like that they want you to adopt the model yes. law that they came out with, Correct. with very little amendments. And so that's where I think we really need to review everything to make sure that it is going to be, you know, that it would apply as needed to the town and meet our needs, but then also make sure that there's not any issues that would arise with the adoption of that you know, and concerns that maybe John or Christy might have as well. Thank you. John, you're uh, muted. This thing there, is that okay? It drives me crazy. It's a great point because we have laws and um, the New York State codes have laws as well. Right now they don't con uh, conflict per se, but we have to see if something new coming in is more stringent than if we adopt the law, I automatically have to go to the stricter code. So if our law says A, but the other code says B, and it's stricter, I have to go with B and leave A away. So it's something to consider, it's a good point. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, John, have a good night. Bye, John. So up next, and keeping with our planning and development theme, we have Jessica Batcher and Tiffany Zazula from Pace Land Use Law Center to discuss our proposed Complete Streets Policy Resolution. Adopting this resolution will move us forward on our Climate Smart Communities Certification Grant, which you might recognize, um, which is in partnership with Pace University to evaluate smart growth along North State Road and adopt a Complete Streets Policy for the Whole town. The North State Road Analysis is being incorporated into our comprehensive plan process, so stay tuned for more on that in the coming months. But adopting a complete streets policy is a relatively simple action that we can take now to put down in writing our intent to prioritize making our roads safer for all, from pedestrians and cyclists 
to automobile drivers, to ADA compliance, and show some progress to the New York State DEC on our grant funding. Tying this back to our presentation from just recently, adopting a complete streets policy earns us climate smart community certification points, which can also help us earn points under clean energy communities. So hopefully you're following all the C's and the S's and the E's in all of that. Before I turn it over to Tiffany and Jessica, I want to rewind and refresh everyone's memory of how we got here. After researching many complete streets policies of other communities and incorporating best practices from across the state, Jessica and Tiffany presented a first draft of the complete streets policy to the town board in September. Since then, the policy was reviewed by the Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee, some changes were recommended and subsequently incorporated into the current draft before the board this evening. And I do believe Valerie Manasser also um, looked at it and also um, worked on some other suggestions that the town board had um, put forth. Additionally, as part of the Comprehensive Plan public engagement efforts, we've been hearing from the community that safe, walkable streets are important and should be prioritized. Also, just to clarify, this is not a local law. It is a resolution stating that the tenets of complete streets are a priority for the town. Quite honestly, they already have been. We consider how to make our streets safe for everyone each and every time we pave or improve a road. So this will codify those best practices by putting pen to paper in the form of a resolution affirming the importance of complete streets. So now, Tiffany and Jessica, welcome. And can you please walk us through, no pun intended, some of the changes that have been incorporated from the committee's feedback. Good evening, everybody. So if you're not tired or confused enough from all the CEC, CSCs and everything else, we're gonna to move to complete streets. So another CS <laughs> um, area. So Victoria, I think you're gonna share the version. I think this is also in your packet. So you have the red line version as well as the final version. But if you wanna see the actual changes that were made, it also includes some changes that were suggested by all of you. So we took into consideration everything that was suggested and. Um, Valerie also did uh, review everything and helped to make some of those changes. So you'll just see as you go through again, the first part is just kind of laying out the reasons why to adopt a complete streets policy and what that policy is really supporting. So you'll just see some language here hitting on um, some of the points that were, again were made uh, by all of you or by the committee um, with the focus on health benefits as that was part of the focus of the grant. So you see that edit. Um, just some tweaking of the language related to kind of the, the history of kind of the, the layout of the streets um, in the town as well. So that's just kind of tweaking language again. Um, so not really much different there. But again, these points are just getting at that, you know, the town is looking to be a leader to support this national movement and then tying into the benefits that it serves for the community and the various points here related to safety, tourist, economic um, impacts as well and supporting all of that. Um, so as you kind of keep going through, you can see again, it, it's talking about biking as well as walking, um, transit as well, but also looking at the, the addition of another clause here that it's focused on the linkages. So the linkage between residents to community resources, open space, park, healthy food, and other healthcare services. So that was an addition that was suggested as well, we see, you see that kind of coming in here. So again, all these points are just kind of going back into kind of the, the purpose behind Complete Streets and what it does to support the community. So, you know, supporting um, issues related to, so just kind of focus on uh, civic life, commerce, tourist experience, uh, public health and independence as well. And then also looking at the equitable aspects. Um, so that's not new, but I'm just reminding you of some of the important things here. And, and then also some of the economic impacts as well as cost savings related to that. Again, the language here, most, most of it was just tweaking of language. So, you know, uh, increasing pedestrian activity, which does kind of also uh, reduce traffic congestion. Um, so, you know, more people walking, less cars on the road. It also puts more people right in front of the shops. So hopefully we'll also increase kind of uh, the vitality of your commercial districts. Um, so uh, the next one is the, again, very, very minor until we get to the end where they're a little bit more substantive, but uh, increases the well being um, of the environment and kind of looking at those environmental impacts as well. Uh, the safety that comes with putting more people on the streets. So that's what that clause is really about. 
And then it moves into the, the safety related to walking and biking and, you know, designing streets that are safe for everybody and not just focus on the vehicles. And then if we get more people out biking and walking, it also helps with the health um, of those in your community. And then tying that back to and condensing that with kind of issues related to children, um, obesity and kind of having opportunities for kids to get out on the streets as well. And also how hopefully that will help to mitigate traffic impacts during the school day. Um, so the more that children can bike or walk to school, safe routes to school programs and things like that, we can increase the health of the children and also offset traffic congestion during those hours. Um, so that was a really good point that was raised um, and incorporated in some of these edits. Um, yeah, so then, you know, moving into kind of the final whereas clause, you know, focusing on, you know, this is supported and very consistent with state and federal policy, as well as kind of within the professional field, um, you know, complete streets is just, again, as uh, the supervisor pointed out, a concept that's, you know, very well accepted and helps to really just build the baseline uh, for supporting these efforts that you've already been supporting for quite some time. Uh, so you see here in the language when we get to uh, now, therefore, be it resolved section, we are looking at kind of how you're going to implement any of this. And again, because it's a resolution, it's not saying that you must do all of these things. It's just outlining the approaches of how you might do these things uh, and achieve these goals through complete streets. So the language here is just clarifying um, that's the town staff and boards with supports with committees that you can identify and charge with supporting this effort will be the ones implementing um, any of the activities related to complete streets in the town. And then specifically supporting education around complete streets. Um, and then the next two um, clauses are really just focused on primarily where complete streets, which you've already been doing, is you know, thinking about that during the construction and project phase and design phase of projects. So those are kind of three of the primary areas is the education and infrastructure development aspects of the complete streets. Um, and again, I think it was a comment from one of you about the bridge uh, construction as well. So not just thinking about, you know, the roads themselves, but if there was any bridge construction, it'd be important to think about that in the context of complete streets. So really good point that was added from our last session. Um, and then just kind of scrolling down. So this is kind of the list of ways um, more specifically that communities incorporate complete streets into day-to-day -day planning policy and activities. Um, and so you'll see kind of this list here of options. So it's not that you have to do all these things. It's just laying out the types of things that you would do. Um, starting with incorporating this as we're already seeing this come up as part of the comprehensive plan conversation with the community so that you would, you know, incorporate it there as relevant. Um, but then some work can also be done inventory and evaluating your streets and transportation network as well as your existing codes. Um, upon that review, you might choose to update policies to be more in line in that code language specifically in line with supporting complete streets. And part of that does have to do with kind of um, development and, you know, positioning development, designing development in a way that is um, compatible with walkability and biking, um, as well as the way it's set up. And that's really con um, consistent with smart growth. Um, principles, which is a big focus of the Climate Smart Communities Program and this particular grant. So it's just kind of highlighting that connection as well um, within the Complete Streets policy itself. And that's where you see kind of, I think, the most tweaking of the language that was done. It's really just highlighting that a decision hasn't been made exactly of what that code language um, and what that change would be, but the principles that would be taken into consideration um, in evaluating that code language really is tied to smart growth principles um, and kind of looking at ways to complement that with the complete streets efforts. Uh, so then uh, these other ones you can see where there's kind of more um, direct editing of the original language, um, you know, supporting transit use to create a sense of enclosure at the pedestrian scale that encourages walkability. And so this is really about the design elements related to um, the complete streets and developing the design and again, uh, noting bridges as part of that effort as well. Um, and then identifying design projects and redesign options for achieving a quality community and street environment. Um, and that is including accessibility as a focus of that. 
And then resources. So identifying as part of this effort, you know, the resources to actually implement these efforts um, to promote easy access to jobs, services, and amenities. Um, and again, going back to the training and education being a very big part of this um, as well. And then ending with uh, assessing opportunities to integrate, accommodate, and balance the needs of all users, um, you know, and address potential obstacles. So really just removing any barriers that might exist um, as part of this process as well. So as you can see, I don't think um, from a substantive standpoint, anything significantly changed in that process, but I think it was refined really nicely taking into consideration a lot of the points that were made when we talked to all of you back I think in September, um, and then got some really helpful feedback from the, the planning, the comprehensive plan committee as well. So um, hopefully that didn't make you all too, too dizzy kind of scrolling through. I know sometimes that's hard, but uh, it's in your materials. And again, I don't think there was really any significant um, substantive changes, but again, just really refining the language to be as reflective as possible of the goals and circumstances in your town. So I will stop there and um, see if there's any questions or further comments um, on the resolution language. Um. I would just like to say that I do think that the um, input has been really great. And I think that it um, it is an improved uh, resolution as a result of the input. And um, so I, I'm grateful for all uh, the people who contributed to it, um, including this board, including the Comprehensive Plan, Plan Steering Committee. So thank you. Uh, and I know there's a couple of attendees who uh, might be in that group. So thank you for that. Uh, so I just open it up to the board if you have any comments. Uh, Councilwoman Feldman, I think you're raising your pen. So yeah, I'll I'm raising you. my pen. Um, I got a few questions. Access to jobs, meaning it would just be easier for people to get to work? Is that yes. what that means? Yeah. Okay. Um, how would, all right, training, um, training and education would be programs for the community to learn how to cross the street properly, look both ways, that kind of stuff? So some of it is just education about what Complete Streets is and the effort and how it integrates with development and other policies of the town. It could be specific programming like bike safety and education related specifically to programs. So it, it's a pretty you know, broad, um, it's mentioned in a couple places, um, staff, uh, engineers, people working on actual infrastructure projects, kind of learning different ways of approaching kind of how you build and design your roads a different way. So there's a lot of different aspects in the education component that could be targeted and, and is referenced in a couple of places um, in, the, in the policy. Okay, somewhere in the middle, it said something about um, natural preservation, housing diversity, open spaces and compact designs. That all doesn't seem to fit in there. In, in the... I mean, it, Natural preservation of our streets, natural, you know, compact design of our streets, housing diversity of our streets. I mean, how does that fit into the whole picture? Well, I'm just looking at the, the which section. It's kind of in the middle. In the middle. It's on the second page. I think that's part of the smart growth principles that you were talking about specifically. The left. Yeah, I mean, that, the compact design housing diversity, I thought you said something that was different than that. So it, it is listing through what are the principles of smart growth, which is talking about where it, it, it's talking about where you build and how you build and how that complements complete streets policy. So it's not talking about the development of the roadway specifically, but it's talking about development in the community and how that complements. So are you talking about where it says, which may include a mix of land uses, compact design, housing diversity, walkability. Th those are listing smart growth principles, which relate to- Oh, so it doesn't have really so much to do with complete streets, but at smart building design principles that complete streets would be talked about during. Exactly. So this is referencing land use policies and regulations, which are regulating development and then how that kind of supports and works with complete streets policies. Okay. And then um, all safety things to do with streets would be incorporated like 
I know, I'm sure the bike lanes, but speed limits and signage, signage, um, and crosswalk, lights, crosswalks, and lighting, yep. and drainage. Okay, yep. perfect. All those things. All good questions. Thank you. And one thing I wanted to note was that we made sure we put language into the um, into the policy that specifically, you know, identifies that as necessary or as appropriate for the town. So this way it allows for that flexibility that if for certain, certain, some of the principles are not appropriate or not necessary for the town, we're not, you know, obliged to have to incorporate those. And as you know, you're going through a comprehensive plan process. And so that also allows for the comprehensive plan to sort of evolve and identify which of those principles you really want to focus on versus others. All right. And they're talking about this as well, obviously. That's correct. Good. Thank you. Any other questions from the board or comments? I just had a comment. Um, being on the comp plan committee, uh, you really uh, used the feedback that you got and made it a better document. So thank you for that. I could actually hear some of the people talking and some of the edits that you made. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we had, we had a lot. It was good. Everybody really thought critically about it. And I think the refinements really made it your own and not just kind of the, the, the template, um, you know, so it's good. It was very helpful. All right. Um, so I think then uh, either Valerie or Jessica or Tiffany, does anybody want to take us through our, I think the next step would be to put it on um, the agenda and adopt the resolution at our next board meeting. That's on. That you, I think, I think we covered it. <laughs> <laughs> that will be your next stop. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, then that's what's up. Okay. Fantastic. So I think then, unless there's any other questions for either Jessica or Tiffany, um, we are going to move to adjourn to executive session. Is there are there any other questions before we do that? I just want to give you guys one more chance. Any other comments, Tiffany? Did you want to say anything? No, I didn't mention that our. Um, I left this one for Jess. Oh. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Okay. So I did mention that our, our comp plan um, public engagement session, our next one is April 8th. And I, I did mention that at the beginning. I just want to reiterate again, since we're talking about that right now. And uh, we'll, that'll be on Zoom. So we'll have more information uh, to come with the Zoom links and the details coming up soon. If you haven't already shared that out, which we might have. Okay. I'm, uh, Yes, yes, it's already been blasted out once. It's on the that once. committee's website. It's on our website. It's there's there's many places where you can find it. Okay, and we'll continue to we'll continue to share that out. So again, if I could have a motion to adjourn to executive session for personnel advice of council collective bargaining and contracts. Um, and I will also just thank Jessica, Tiffany, Valerie, even I want to thank Christy for uh, all of your help with uh, all of the work that goes into our uh, jobs every single day. We really appreciate you helping us flesh out the future of the town. So thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. And if I can have a motion. Hey, everyone. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, so thanks so much for joining us tonight. Our next meeting will be a regular meeting and that's Tuesday, March 23rd at 7 p.m. As usual, you can join us via Zoom or dial in by phone. Information for each meeting is included on our website each Friday and in my supervisor's update. So I uh, hope that you will check it out and we will see you soon and have a great night, everybody. Hopefully we'll be back to in-person in the not too distant future. Although we've all gotten very comfortable sitting in our, at home and not having to get up and go through all sorts of weather to get to uh, a variety of places for our meetings. But nevertheless, we're looking forward to seeing everybody in person at some point in the not too distant future. So. Have a great night, everybody.